Twitter earnings, Amazon earnings, Samsung earnings. Plus, we talked to Kate Conger of Gizmodo about Uber's shell company in the Bahamas. All that and so much more coming up on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1819, recorded Thursday, July 27th, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. And by ZipRecruiter. Are you looking to hire a tech professional? With ZipRecruiter, you can post to 100 plus job boards, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is a show where we tell you what you need to know about what happened today in technology. I'm Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Howell. Earnings, that's what happened. Well, and some other things. I promise you, it's not all earnings today. But we'll start with earnings of the company we all love, although maybe not all of us are flocking there, apparently. Flocking. Uh, <laughs> flocking to Twitter. <laughs> Twitter released its quarterly earnings and things are looking so hot on the user growth side of, of, of the deal. Uh, joining us to pick the numbers apart is Kurt Wagner from Recode. Welcome back. It's been a while. It has been a while. How are you guys doing? Thank you for having me. Doing all awesome, and it's always a pleasure to get you on. So uh, I think the thing that jumped out to everyone uh, this time was literally no growth in monthly active users, zero on the chart that you published on Recode. How is that possible after bringing in 9 million new users uh, the previous quarter? That's a good question, and I don't <laughs> have a substantial, uh, a sufficient answer for you, unfortunately. We don't really know. I don't know. I mean, analysts were looking for about $4 million. I thought that seemed doable given that they did $9 million, uh, last quarter. But this has been what Twitter has been, right? I mean, I think that we watched for two years when the company basically was not growing that MAU number at all. And then they had a, a kind of quarter out of nowhere in Q1 where they had these 9 million new users. And I think a lot of folks, including myself, thought maybe President Donald Trump had something to do with that. And now they're just kind of back to earth and people seem really surprised. But like, why are we surprised? Because this is what Twitter has been dealing with for the last two years. So I don't know why it was zero, but I'm also not shocked that it was zero. This doesn't actually mean that we've all been playing in the same sandbox with the same people for three months and there's been absolutely no new users, right? It's a, it's kind of a net net effect of the net. Ad. Yeah, of course. So uh, let's pretend that a million new people did sign up and a million uh, folks who were kind of dormant decided that they were no longer going to use Twitter. The net additions were zero. So Twitter is not any larger. But uh, yes, it's very possible uh, that there are new users to Twitter, just not necessarily more users to Twitter. Right, right. Now, obviously, Wall Street has been reacting pretty harshly to this. You could expect that. Um, is this a bigger red flag now than it has been in the past? Like, at what point do we worry about Twitter more than we already are? <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I think so, right? Uh, it's it's more worrisome now because they've had more and more time to fix it and it's still not fixed. So I think that there are people who love Twitter and who will defend Twitter to the death and they'll tell you that, hey, daily active user growth is up and that means that even though the pie is not necessarily getting bigger, you know, there are more people that are already on the platform that are using it more often and that's a good sign. Um, that is a super, super positive way to look at this. I think in, in reality, when you see that Twitter has apparently hit basically a ceiling, if you will, for its like overall growth for an ads business, a business that relies on, you know, getting ads in front of as many people as possible, that's not a very good sign. And, uh, you know, Jack Dorsey has now been there for like two years, I believe. Um, so it's not as if we can keep saying, Hey, you know, you got to give him time to fix things like there has been time and I think Twitter has uh, kind of solidified itself as a service that's only going to be relevant to a certain number of people. I mean, 300 plus million people is still a lot. Uh, it's not Facebook, right? So I think 
We just need to come to grips with the fact that Twitter is going to be a great platform for hardcore news junkies and people who love, you know, talking about live sports. But uh, for the vast majority of the Internet, Twitter is not going to be a place that that is really relevant to them. And so, so monthly active users haven't changed or those have gone down? So monthly active users were uh, were level. So level. net ads were basically no no growth on monthly active users. But daily active users are up. So that just means those of us who are really addicted to it are there are more of us that are addicted to it, or we're spending more time. Those of us addicted to Twitter. Yeah, I mean theoretically, we don't know because daily active is different than time spent, right? Um, so it's, it's not necessarily a sign that we're all spending twice as much time on Twitter. It just simply means that there are more people going to Twitter on a daily basis. Um, and again, I think a lot of that has to be from our current political uh, uh, cycle right now, right? I mean, how if you are a news person or someone who really cares about uh, what's happening in politics, you're probably checking Twitter every single day. A year ago, you probably didn't have to do that. So I think that's the, the key there is that there are just simply more hardcore users than there used to be. So I know Snapchat makes a lot of like the engagement of their users and, you know, uh, just just the value of their users, their daily active users. Can Twitter say the same thing? Can they say like, hey, you know, we have these dedicated daily active users and that's important. Advertisers give us more money. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's what the optimists will tell you is they'll say, hey, we, we don't have 600 million. We only have 300 and half of those are diehard. Like half of those people are the people you want to reach. And that's why they're so much more valuable than other platforms. I think the problem is, uh, as far as I can tell, Twitter has never been able to actually show that it can do, a, it, you know, that those 150 million people, if you want to call it uh, that, that they are actually more valuable than, say, the 2 billion people you can find on Facebook, right? So until Twitter can actually prove that, having a hardcore Twitter user is more valuable than a casual Facebook user, uh, it doesn't really matter. So that is that is the challenge at this point is like, what can Twitter offer that others can't? Well, I was just talking to Burke, who uh, is in our studio, and you know, he said he's not on Twitter very often. And I asked him, like, are you a Dow or a Mao? Are you a daily active uh, user or a monthly active user? He said he's probably a Yao. Is there such thing as yearly active users? Does anyone <laughs> care about that? Uh, not in my world. <laughs> no, no, the people I'm interacting with, uh, you know, you got to show up at least once a week if you want to, uh, you know, have part of the conversation. So, yeah. Do you, uh, you, you did say though that the kind of the daily active user is, is the glimmer of hope. Is that, is that enough to keep Twitter out of trouble in the short term? I mean, you make a really good point that, you know, we're so used to looking at these services and expecting grow, grow, grow. And I'm sure that's what the shareholders want. Grow, grow, grow. But still, 300 million, you know, active users is a, is a pretty sizable audience. Maybe maybe this is where Twitter lives. Twitter just lives in the 300 million mark. I think that's exactly where it's going to live, right? I mean, for the last two years, it's gone from like 304 to 328 million, right? I mean... At this rate, it's going to be between three and four hundred million for the next seven years or yeah. six years. So, uh, this is where Twitter is going to live, and and people are, I guess, coming to grips with what that means. Um, you know, as I wrote today, if you're an optimist and you and you believe this DAU number and and the fact that there are more hardcore Twitter users than there were a year ago really matters, um, then sure, I guess that that's a positive thing because. Any site that has 200 million people going to it every single day, that, that's going to be a business. How big of a business, we don't know, but it, that will survive in some capacity, I would think. Um, for me, as someone who, you know, kind of looks at the, um, the, the ceiling or the perceived ceiling of companies like this, I think there's going to be a ton of people who feel that Twitter are totally underachieved or is underachieving. And that is where you see the disappointment from Wall Street because you say, why are there 200 million people who just literally can't live without your service and yet the rest of the internet doesn't even seem to care at all? Uh, I'm not really sure why that is. I don't know if people don't care about news or if it's too cumbersome to be constantly bombarded with tweets, um, but there's clearly a disconnect between people who really, really get a lot out of Twitter and, and the vast majority of people online. What if it's really just the way that we're looking at privacy? I mean, there's been a lot more movement to Facebook Messenger. I know Instagram uh, direct messaging is getting bigger. What if we've just, like, as, as aside from us crazy 
uh, people that the daily active users that are on there all day. What about uh, if people are just saying, you know what? Like I've seen people's lives be ruined by something they said two years ago on Twitter. I've seen their careers be ruined and, you know, people are sharing less on Facebook. What about if it's just that we're living in a time where, uh, where we see that all this information being posted publicly is not the best idea? Yeah, I think that that's, I think that's a fair uh, you know, criticism for why aren't people posting more? I don't think that, and, and I've heard this from so many people over the years, like, why don't you use Twitter? And they say, well, I don't have anything to say, or I don't know what to say, or, or maybe I'm concerned about privacy. There is no need for you to post to Twitter to get value from Twitter. Right. And that has never really been the company's message. And that's never really been talked about. There is no reason that you shouldn't be able to have a Twitter account Follow all of the politicians that you want to hear from, all the athletes and musicians that you want to hear from, get your news and literally never have to say anything yourself. And yet Twitter could still be a useful tool to you. I don't think people realize that. And I think people get very intimidated by the fact that they feel that they need to publish something or say something and that it's going to be public for, you know, forever. Um, so I think you bring up a good point. I think Twitter could do a better job of explaining to people that, hey, you don't actually need to participate in the conversation to get value from the conversation. But man, Twitter's had a lot of opportunity to uh, clarify how its service is, is good to those people. It just hasn't happened very well. Uh, Kurt Wagner from Recode, always appreciate bringing you on, man. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Take care, guys. All right. Take care. Amazon reported earnings today as well, and with it, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos also made some news with his own earnings. For a brief shining moment, Bezos was the richest person in the world with a small fortune of $90 billion beating out Bill Gates. Uh, the surge in Bezos's wealth was not due to him opening an Instagram account, which he also did this week, but because of a surge in Amazon shares ahead of the earnings report, but then when the earnings report failed to meet expectations, Bezos fell back to the number two spot. Oh, poor Bezos. I know, no longer the it's richest feel man. Awful. Yeah, the second, that must really be horrible to be the <laughs> second know. richest man in, oh. the, in the world. Uh, by all accounts, Amazon is still crushing it. They're still an unstoppable force with no immovable objects in its way, except maybe the FTC. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's probably very true. Uh, yeah, Gates has held that top spot since 2013. So this was a blip on the radar. I wonder where Gates would sit in this chart if you were to offset it with all of his spending and philanthropy. He'd probably still be way further ahead. But this is a rating of as of now. And, you know, Bezos got a taste of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sure Bezos wants more. I'm imagining he, he wants even more of that top spot. So we'll see. Uh, Bezos. I don't know. I mean, do you really? I, I can't imagine that. I mean, it's like it's they have more than enough for their themselves, their families, their families, families forever. I'm sure. I'm sure it probably doesn't register, you know, in the way that anyone who has never been a billionaire probably thinks. But there's probably a part of you that's mm -hmm. like, yeah, but I mean, I'm already here. I'm literally one step away from being the richest person in the world. Why not? You know, um, but I've never been the richest person in the world, so I can't speak for them. Not yet. Uh, not yet. I'm working on it. <laughs> Uh, as for the earnings, though, you know, Walmart, they, they have a lot of competition going on. Like they are they're dominating and there's no end in sight to the dominance of Amazon. They just keep on expanding into different places like Whole Foods and everything like that. But they have a lot of challenges ahead of them. Walmart is is big time competition. I think Walmart's really stepping it up and going to apply some pressure. Microsoft and Alphabet, big challengers in cloud. It's not all Amazon's game in, in the cloud. Uh, they've got a lot of competition there. Um, so, I mean, it's not all as, you know, it's not always a, a piece of cake here, but man, they are crushing it. Like you say, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. I mean, the cloud business really did grow and yeah, there are other people in the cloud business, but they're not that close to Amazon. Yeah. Like they're pretty far behind Amazon. I mean, cloud is only 10% of their income though. They sold 106, $136 billion worth of stuff. <laughs> And that's only getting more and more stuff. and more as more people sign up for Prime. And, I know. Uh, gosh, this is crazy. Uh, by the way, I heard this uh, yesterday. This reminded me Amazon is is expanding its workforce again. There's some somewhere around like 350,000 employees at the moment. Uh, they're doing a job fair next week at around a dozen of their warehouses. They plan on hiring 50,000 employees in a single day like offers job offers on the spot because they need to boost up uh, their workforce. 40,000 of those full-time jobs preparing for the holidays. 
you know, and a lot of other things, including like their ready to cook meal boxes and all the other stuff they have going on. So uh, if that isn't an indication if, that a company wants to hire 50,000 people potentially in one day of their dominance, I don't know what is. Yeah. It's and crazy. I mean, and Bezos is also sort of changing his image a little bit. Like we've been reading a lot about that, yeah. like the Instagram account. And he's, I think, becoming a little more approachable, which is good for a CEO. I mean, when you think about like Bill Gates, uh, while a wonderful man who's given away most of his fortune um, was never very approachable. And a lot of people say that's why like the government came after him. Like that's mm -hmm. why the government came after them in antitrust. Like some people say that's why like Uber was doing so badly because Travis Kalanick was a jerk, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, and some people argue that's why Facebook is doing so well because Mark Zuckerberg is a friendly guy yeah, and has really become a friendly guy. So it means a lot if you're likable. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, Samsung keeps kicking butt as well, brushing aside its many issues with the one thing that matters most, profit. Samsung's net profit rose 89% year over year up to 11.05 trillion won or around $9.9 .9 billion for the quarter. That's its highest quarterly net profit beating its own previous record of 8.24 trillion won from the height of the smartphone boom four years ago. 70% uh, this time of its success uh, came not from smartphones, but from semiconductor and display business that's very successful with Samsung and kind of filling the gaps of the smartphone. But the company did say that the, the Galaxy S8 outsold the S7 in nearly all regions. So uh, it, and I, it just kind of blows me away how good, how well Samsung is doing, even though I've, I fully realize they've got a lot of different avenues from which they derive revenue. It's not all just smartphones, which is a lot of what we end up talking about on the show. Um, but, they, but they've got this insane corruption scandal happening uh, behind the scenes that involves, uh, you know, Li uh, Zhe Yang, the company's head. And yet, you know, he's testifying next week. That could land him in in prison as, as a result. Verdict expected next month. Yet Samsung is just navigating all of it because they're just making crazy bank. But it's also the quarter. I think the, the this quarter is really good for them. Um, yeah. It's the well, quarter yeah. where they have a phone out and then sure. um, and then. They're, so they've, they've said that they expect the mobile earnings to dip in the third quarter um, as the S8 sales trail off. And yeah, as which we we're see in right the now, new yeah. iPhone. Yeah, but then you know what? It shoots back up. Like Samsung, their release schedule is really smart because they've got the S8, at least when you're talking about smartphones, mm -hmm. the S8 smart. in, the, in the, <laughs> uh, the second quarter, and then they've got the Note 8 in the in the latter half of the third quarter, early fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. I can't, no, that's actually August. That's the next month, I think, is when that announcement is expected. So they've spaced them out, and then you lead into the holidays. So as far as their smartphone sales are concerned, uh, yeah, smart. Yeah, they. I mean, I guess they they last topped Apple's quarterly earnings in 2010. Right. So they're they're likely to in one of the quarters uh, top Apple again, which is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Yep. The Senate introduced new legislation today called the Electronic Communications Privacy Modernization Act that aims to revamp the current Electronics Communication Act. The current rules around whether law enforcement needs a warrant to access your email and location data were established the same year Madonna's Papa Don't Preach and Huey Lewis and the News Stuck on You were number one on the billboard shorts. You went shorts. digging for those, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, that's 1986 <laughs> in case you're too lazy to Google it. Google, uh, also something that didn't exist when the Electronics Communication Act was written. Uh, wow. Tireless electronic privacy activists and bipartisan buddies, Republican Senator Ma Mike Lee from Utah and Democratic Senator Patrick Leahy from Vermont introduced the bill. So they have been working on this for a while. A lot of this has just been knocking around. Uh, they are trying to modernize it, hence the word modernization. The new law will require a warrant to access emails 180 days or old or older, would also protect your cloud uh, storage. Basically, they want the same rights for written communication as uh, electronic communication. Well, yeah, and like you said, also around location, you know, they, they make the point of like, just because we have a 
phone on a smartphone on us at all times doesn't mean that our location as users should just be open without any restrictions uh, for, for law enforcement. They should have to go through steps in order to be able to, you know, track based on that information. There's also reforms expected around uh, protections around metadata, changes to the gag rule that companies are required to not say when um, when law enforcement has come for information about a particular individual. Uh, the Email Privacy Act, they've done this a couple of times, I guess, leading up, and apparently earlier this year, uh, it passed overwhelmingly in the House, so this is like the next step of that. And uh, yeah, bipartisan, which, which kind of, I don't know why that surprised me that, that everybody's kind of getting behind this, but um, I'm happy to see that they are. Well, I think privacy has always been, privacy really during the Obama administration was a bipartisan issue. It was the mm. thing that people were coming together like, hey, yeah, we don't want uh, to uh, our location. We, we don't want people to know that we're still listening to Huey Lewis in the news. We don't want people to know. Uh, our I say wear that on a t-shirt if you're still listening <laughs> okay. to Huey Lewis in the news. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but <laughs> yes, I mean, and things have become more partisan just in the last, you know, since, since yeah. November. And it's unfortunate, but I like to see this because this is, yeah, I think our, uh, these should be modernized for yeah. sure. Yeah, and good for good for uh, citizens and consumers and everything. Google, by the way, I mean, no surprise, technology companies are going to be supporting this. Google's testified testified four different times since 2010 supporting reforms like this, so they're for sure going to be behind this. After the break, Kate Conger from Gizmodo tells us how she found the shell company that Uber used to acquire self driving truck company Auto. But first. Let's take a minute to thank Rocket Mortgage, the sponsor of this episode. The mortgage experience wasn't keeping up with the times. It was dated and it needed a client-focused technological revolution. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's simple, allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. It's convenient. Their trusted partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. It's powerful. So whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th, Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations in seconds based on your income, assets, and credit. Rocket Mortgage can analyze all of the home loan options for which you qualify and then find the one that's right for you. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. That's rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states. NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. Last summer, late last summer, Uber acquired self-driving startup Auto, too much fanfare. If you've been following along, you know the deal now stands at the center of the legal battle between Alphabet's Waymo and Uber. Kate Conger from Gizmodo dug deep Hello. into the details of the purchase and is here to talk about what she found. Welcome to the show, Kate. Hi, thanks for having me. So first things first, uh, you write that after the purchase, Auto's intellectual property got funneled to Uber through a shell company called operate how clear are we that this is a harry potter reference um i mean i very much first. want it to be a harry potter <laughs> reference i sort of got I sort of got the Glomar response from Uber, which was that they could neither confirm nor deny whether the employee who named the company was a Harry Potter fan. So um, I'm rooting for Harry Potter, of course, but I don't know for sure. <laughs> okay, so, so why did they create this shell company? Um, so Uber creates a lot of shell companies for tax reasons, and this one in particular was created to manage Uber's intellectual property specifically for self-driving cars. So they put a lot of the patents that they acquired from auto into the shell company. They also put a lot of their own self-driving car uh, patents into this company as well. So so talk a little bit about the timeline. The timeline is what, I mean, they say this is a coincidence, but um, when the shell company was established and when Anthony Lewandowski at the, the center, um, you know, the founder of auto who worked for Google and then uh, worked for Uber and works for neither now. Uh, what's the timeline between when he left Google and when the uh, shell company was created? So he left Google in late January of 2016. And in February, he signed um, like a contract, a purchasing agreement with Uber to sort of start the acquisition process. And at the, the shell company was formed the day 
after that agreement was signed. So the timing really lines up as if this company was created just to handle the transfer of auto into Uber. Um, Uber, of course, would dispute that and said that it was a broader effort to manage their intellectual property on self-driving cars. I'm curious to know kind of about, you You talk a little bit uh, in your piece, you write about the value of, of royalty yeah. rates in speculative technology, which you could consider spe- self-driving technology to be somewhat speculative. It's The value of it is relatively unknown. We haven't entered a world where self-driving cars are everywhere and there could be a value placed to, to that in society. So explain how this could really benefit Uber uh, if and when that technology takes off, if it, if it ever does. Yeah, so Uber's arrangement with their intellectual property is a little weird. Normally, how companies might handle something like this, they would do all of the development with the patents still in in the United States and write off those development research costs as a tax write-off. And then once they had a product that they were ready to bring to market, they would move the patent overseas to kind of um, take the profit from that intellectual property into a more tax-friendly nation. What Uber's doing is a little bit different. They are transferring their patents very early before they're bringing something to market. And so they kind of have the advantage of setting uh, a friendly royalty rate when they license that technology back to their United States company, where they can say, this is how much this technology is worth. And there's not really anything in the market to dispute that or to uh, price the technology against. And so you talk to representatives from Uber. How How do they explain why they're doing this? They said that it was the, the establishment of the company was just sort of a larger um, a larger part of their process of managing their self-driving car unit. And it's something that they do for a lot of their tax purposes. There's They have many, many shell companies outside of the United States. Um, and so they said that this is just part of how they are managing their self-driving technology. Now, of course, we've uh, we've followed the story pretty closely, the Uber Waymo case that that continues to escalate and and all the craziness that's ensuing behind the scenes on that. Is there um, is there any way that this uh, these these offshore holdings could be affected by the results, the outcome of the case? What I'm really interested to see with this case is if we get to the damages stage, that is, if uh, if Waymo wins their case. They prove in court that the technology was stolen. Uh, What's going to happen after that is the court is going to have to decide how much that technology is worth and how much in damages Uber would have to pay to Waymo. And so the fact that Uber has transferred these patents and kind of assigned a price to what this technology is worth, I think, could be really interesting and really relevant once the damages stage rolls around. Mm -hmm. So, so where does auto stand now? I mean, are they uh, are they just sort of, are, are they doing anything? Are they developing technology? Are they, are they moving forward on the self-driving truck technology? Um, well, so that, that's a little bit confusing. Um, auto sort of split into during the acquisition. So there's the main auto technologies that went into Uber and they are developing technology as part of Uber's advanced technologies group. That's their self-driving car unit. And then auto trucking is still sort of off hovering as its own entity, but um, I'm not aware that they're working on any technology right now. Okay, thank you so much. Kate Conger is a senior reporter at Gizmodo. She can be found, all of her great work can be found at gizmodo.com. You write about a lot of different uh, interesting tech topics and you can also be found on Twitter at Kate Conger. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Have a great night. All right, up next... We pour one out for the iPod Nano, but first, I don't have one actually to pour out. It's too bad we didn't bring beer to the set. Uh, But first, let's take a minute to thank ZipRecruiter, the sponsor of this episode. If you are in charge of hiring, you know that you have the most important job in the company. The people that you hire are going to make or break your business, but... How do you know where to post jobs to find the most qualified candidates? It's not that easy. The internet's a big, big place. There's talent hiding in all sorts of corners. They're they're uh, you know they're all over the place. So locating them, finding them is the big challenge. And ZipRecruiter will connect you to the most qualified candidates for any job, including highly sought after tech professionals. With just one click, you can post your job to 100 plus job sites. Their powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job better than anyone else. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. 
it finds them. In fact, over 80% of jobs that are posted on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate in just 24 hours. So no more juggling emails, no more calls to your office. You simply screen, rate, and manage the candidates all in one place. You use ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. They make it really easy and cohesive. Uh, you connect with a wide variety of professionals, including IT experts, and take your company to the next level today. More than 200 million applications have been delivered. And if you're currently searching for a job, by the way, ZipRecruiter will help find your future job in any industry, including technology, government, business, finance, and more. You can upload your resume and apply with a single click. Be sure to check out the ZipRecruiter blog for recruiting tips and career advice as well. Lots of important information in there. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, you can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of tech news today. Uh, feedback time. John from Minneapolis wrote in to say, I just I was just watching episode 1818 and you were talking about the Lego programming of robots. He says, this has been around since the late 1990s, although it looks like this kit is a new way of teaching the programming. I volunteer with High Tech Kids uh, that runs Lego tournaments for kids as part of the first Lego League program. We've been running tournaments since 1998 and now have over 600 teams with each team averaging eight kids thought you'd like to know more about the lego programming that's awesome i mean yeah and i know that there are other other kits that kind of hinge around building things that aren't just your standard you know uh millennium falcon or whatever you know that that are a little bit more automated a little bit smarter uh and stuff so lego's got their their hands in a lot of different avenues in this regard so yeah, well, Lego Mindstorms have been right. around forever, we and I, we had them come on the uh, the screensavers on Tech TV, and it's funny because I, I I remember when you know when you just hear about something if the. When you first hear about something, it just tickles the back of your mind. I remember for a long time thinking Minecraft was Lego Mindstorms. Like, until it became important enough to me right. to figure out what Minecraft was, I was yeah. like, oh, those are two different things. Yeah. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah. But in some ways, very similar. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> TNT's fan of the day is Camilo Muriel, who sent us this nested image showing yesterday's fan of the day in a picture in picture window on his Android O device. Yeah, click Camilo the picture, says, the I thing. don't always tweet, but when I do, I prefer DOS TNT. Yeah, I wasn't sure if that was a misspelling or, or something, but dos whatever, TNT? we'll go with it. Dos I TNT. prefer the TNT or like DOS. Oh, DOS, too. Two. I dos. didn't think about that when I Not brought dos. it up. That makes a lot of dos. sense. Because it's nested, you know? Not DOS, yeah, DOS. <sighs> Thank you. Using picture in picture, inside picture in picture, Android Oception. Love it. I love it, too. <laughs> um, yeah, so you might, maybe he is also a Yao, like Burke. Yeah. A yearly active user. Yeah, I was, I was thinking there could even be like a decade active user, but that would be DAU and that's already taken with daily active users. Right. So we'd have to get really creative. But what, Why isn't there WOWs? Wow. Weekly active users. <laughs> well, I, 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 I mean, I don't want to go too into my psyche, but I do believe that I have a little bit of a Twitter addiction. Yeah. And I, they do say that once you do something every day for 30 days, like you can be addicted to it. or maybe it's the opposite once you stop doing something for 30 days that's all it takes i don't know I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it probably works in the other direction too i would consider myself addicted to twitter uh as well so you learn something about yeah it. show us how you watch or listen just record a video uh and put a picture up on instagram google plus twitter or facebook unless you feel that you too like us are addicted then just email it to us we'll take it there yeah. too. tnt at, at twitter.com we don't want to enable use the hashtag hashtag how I watch TNT, but only if you're not addicted. I think we've been addicted to email longer than we've been addicted to Twitter. I don't think I'm addicted to email. Email is just, it's not fun. Well, I don't get the same. In, well, I you guess, check yeah. it every day. I, but I, and I, I don't know if I consider Twitter fun. Well, there <laughs> Sometimes are it's a necessary evil. No, yes, I think I, there I are suppose. endorphins. Yeah. I guess I get the same endorphins from email, but I could give up email if I could, like I could give up my personal email for weeks. I mean, I do. You probably got those endorphins. I know I did when email first, when you yes. first started mm -hmm. using email. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere along the line over the many, many years that I've been, at least for myself, that I've been using email, it, it turned from this like analog of opening the mailbox and finding something addressed to you and going, oh, I wonder what it is into uh, another email. 
that's just the, the way the world works, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Today marks the end of two iconic music players that made their debut back in 2005, a year that I think I was already addicted to email at that point. The iPod <laughs> Nano and the iPod Shuffle, the last two Apple music players that aren't running iOS. Uh, though it shouldn't come as much of a surprise as the devices haven't actually seen any product updates in in years at this point. Uh, not only that, neither device supports Apple streaming service, Apple Music, and something tells me that would bug the powers that be at the company just a little bit to have music players that they were selling that didn't support Apple Music. Uh, Apple did announce a price cut to the iPod Touch, though, 32 gigs for $199 and 128 gigs for $299. I had many nanos. Yeah. Uh, at one point, we were a like five nano family. Um, I I'm not nerdy enough to know which generation, but I know I had the two. I think I had like the second generation nano. I had the fat one. I had yeah, the skinny the one. I had the one, rounded yeah. edges one. I had like I would put it in my pants and run them through the washing machine, and so then I have to get another one. <laughs> um, I use it for running all the time. It was attached to my Nike Plus that like I kept the thing in my wow, shoe. Wow, you had the Nike Plus. I, Wow. The Nike Plus little tag. Yeah. Do you remember that you like? Yeah, you I never, I never had those. I, I always wondered how. Yeah, oh, how I had people it. Were, I, were doing that. I recently went to Nike.com and uh, they still had my runs from like 2007 or something. Uh, it was crazy. Oh, like wow. I was running a lot more <laughs> back then. It was kind of sad to look at it. Um, I miss these. Uh, we still have a few of the fat ones. Yeah. I think. Cause it was a process. Like I would, yeah. like for me, you know, I had my playlist, um, and I my playlist involved podcasts and music, and I would put it together, and then I would attach it to my computer, and I was running Windows for many of those years. It was not easy, but, um, but I did it, and yeah. then my kids loved them because they had all their audiobooks on them. And occasionally we'd let them put a movie on it and they would watch it on the little thing. <laughs> I never understood watching a movie on that tiny little screen. Well, that's because we were like, you know, we were, you know, like you are with your little kids where it's like, we're going to keep media from them. And <laughs> then we went, just opened the floodgates and it all came out. But in the right. back, so we're like, oh, if you can watch that little Pixar movie on the tiny screen, you won't, you know, be addicted to it. I mean, did. yeah. And the, the, the paradigm of how we sync music to our devices. I mean, we don't sync it anymore. You know, it downloads directly to our devices and anything other than that is just incredibly inconvenient. The thought of taking this little device and having to plug it directly into the computer, open up software, manually manage it, or maybe it's automatic, but still just that process versus just holding up your phone and going subscribe and having it all happen automatically. We're just in a different state, but man, it was magical at one point. Well, it was also magical to my children because we didn't let them have video games either. And then they discovered oh, they, them. Yes. Remember they yeah, had like two basic, little tiny yep. games and they would like, we would, I remember like keep wait, coming in to like turn off the iPod because the stories would go and then I would find it like with one of my boys and it was like they had fallen asleep playing and whatever little dumb little game. game. Yeah. <laughs> Kids will find yeah, a way. They will find a way. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 2300 UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us. That's TNT at twit.tv. Leave us a short voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW, and find us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. And subscribe to this show, twit.tv slash TNT, and subscribe to Jason's show. That's twit.tv, A-A-A. Subscribe to twit.tv iOS today. Subscribe to both. <laughs> subscribe to all the shows, all the other ones too. And if you want to tweet at me, I'm at Megan Maroney. And I'm at Jason Howell. Thanks, Brian Burnett, for pushing buttons. Big thumbs up. Thanks to Burke for uh, helping us here in the studio and occasional thumbs up. I'll give you a thumbs up though. Uh, <laughs> thanks to Kevin for editing the show, I think. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everybody.